good. From fear to faith. My life for uh, many years after I got born again was just filled with fear. I was paralyzed by fear. And it wasn't really until I heard the word of faith. I first heard it out in India. Because guess who I met in India? <laughs> and as I received the word of faith, the, the fear went. I, did, I didn't actually have a specific prayer for deliverance from fear. It just it went as I got into faith. The, the fear left. But it tells us in Proverbs that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And we're going to do some searching out of matters today. And it's not that God hides things from people. It's just we access things in the kingdom of God by faith. So those things are not accessible uh, to the natural man because we get them by faith. They're concealed for us. They're not concealed from us. And we're going to search out some things on, on faith this afternoon. So there are two systems out there in which the born-again man can operate. There's only one system in which the, the natural man can operate. But there's two systems in which the born-again man can operate. There's the power of darkness, and that's where he doesn't want to be operating, because he's, he's not actually under the authority of darkness anymore. But the power of do darkness operates by fear. And uh, if we're living as if though we are a natural man, we're living under that authority of darkness still as a born-again man, then we're going to access what the devil wants to give us through fear. And then there's the kingdom of God system, which operates by faith. That's where we should be living as born-again people. Because uh, Colossians 1.13 tells us that we've been delivered from the authority of, from under the authority of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son. We're in that kingdom. We're not under the authority of darkness anymore. So why would we want to live under it and live under what the devil wants to give us? Yeah. So, but we access all that God has made available, like I say, by faith. So we don't manage fear. Uh, we don't tolerate it in our lives. We overcome fear and get it out of our lives. And, and the way to overcome fear is to walk by faith. So we had deliverance from fear yesterday, but we don't need to be focusing too much on fear. If we're focusing on, on walking by faith and operating under the kingdom of God's system, then the fear will go. In 1 John 5, it tells us that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But in, in verse 4 of that chapter, it tells us that for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Well, wherever it says whatever or whoever, that means we are eligible. You are eligible. I'm a whatever or a whoever. So wherever you see that in the Bible, you're eligible. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You can overcome the world if you're born again. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. That is past tense. I think that was past tense when I was at school. It's still past tense now. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We're born again. Abraham is our father, the father of faith. And we walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had. And as we walk by faith, just like Abraham, we are blessed. It tells us in Galatians 3 verse 9, for those making notes, I'll just mention the text. I think I said that last time and then I didn't mention any text, but I'll try and mention them this time. Galatians 3 9. It says, so then those who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So we walk by faith and we are blessed. And we're blessed because as we walk by faith, we overcome the world and the things that the devil tries to throw at us. And we access instead all that God has for us. So things like life, health, peace, prosperity, all those things that, that uh, Jesus died to give us, we, we can access them by faith as we walk by faith. And for our faith to work, according to Romans 10.8, Romans 10.8, it says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. So for our faith to work, according to that verse, it needs to be in two places. It needs to be in our mouth and in our heart. And of course, it's faith in the word. Now, 
It also tells us in Romans that, that uh, God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. That is talking about believers. If you read the, the whole passage, it's not talking about every human being. It's talking about believers. So God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. You have the measure of faith if you're born again. You've already got faith. God's put it in there. And there's no such thing as a believer without faith. We wouldn't have been able to get saved if we didn't have any faith. So, but we need to exercise our faith to develop it. You, you see people who just seem to be receiving from God all the time, all sorts of different things. And then on the other hand, you see Christians who are sick or weak, they're poor, and, and so on and so on. And that shouldn't be. Uh, they, they can access the same things that those other people that are, are, are accessing things from God can access. But we do need first to understand what God's made available to us through the redemption. And, and we read about that in his word, particularly in the epistles. Uh, we find out what, what God's made available to us. When Jesus died and he went down to hell and then he rose again. And we need to understand that because frankly a lot of Christians just don't even know what Jesus did when he died on the cross. They might know he died for their sins and that's about it. Romans 10.17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we hear the word of God, faith comes. You're hearing the word of God this afternoon. Faith is coming. Amen. There's no such thing as faith not coming if you're hearing the word. Faith always comes when we hear the word. Faith comes through hearing the word, and our faith needs to be in the word. And that sounds obvious, but it is important because our faith needs to be based on the word and not what somebody else said or what somebody else did. A lot of people can make that mistake. They can have heard something and they, they just sort of remember that. And they're not actually basing their faith on the word. They're basing it on something they've heard. It is true that God is no respecter of persons. But in order to get the same results as somebody else, we need to do what they did. When, when we hear a testimony, and, and what they did may have been to put that word into them over time, been putting it in, putting it in. And if we just think we can just grab onto one thing and sort of, oh, that's all right, I'll have that, thank you, I'll have the same as them. And we haven't actually seen what they did before to get to that point. So we'll have a look at that this afternoon. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Luke 6, Luke 6, 46 to 49. It's very hard to do what God's called you to do, isn't it, when you're full of fear? But it's impossible. Luke 6, 46. Where are we? But why do you, <clears throat> excuse me, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So, as he said it in his word, healing, prosperity, joy, peace, etc., etc. If he said it, we can have it. But we need to be doers of the word, as James said, and not hearers only. Because if we're hearers only, we are deceiving ourselves. We need to be doers of the word as well. And, and James goes on to say, that's, that was James 1.22, and in verse 25 he goes on to say, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, this, this word is the perfect law of liberty, it will set you free, and continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. It's the, the doer of the word that is the blessed one, not just the hearer. Right, we're still in Luke 6, aren't we? So, um, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings, it says a whoever. I'm eligible for that. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, it does say when, not if, when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. He didn't even bother to clear the earth away. Just built his house there without a foundation. Against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. 
Now, you'll know that the second man did two out of the three things. He came and he heard, but he didn't do. It wasn't the storm that destroyed his house. It was his failure to found his house on the rock and, and to do that vital unseen work that in the time of trouble, in the time of the storm, would have caused his house to be unshakable. Or to put it another way, it, he failed to put into practice what he heard. And on the other side, it wasn't the storm that made the first man strong. He'd already done the work and laid the foundation on the rock. He was like a man who forms a firm foundation by hiding the word in his heart day by day before the storm comes. Against this, the storms of life, whatever they are, have no power. If we will take the word and we will put it into our hearts. And that word needs to be in our hearts for our faith to overcome. So it's one of the two places that we need the word, in our, in our mouth and in our hearts. Well, Galatians tells us that we are of the household of faith. We're talking about houses. Galatians 6.10, I think we hear it read out here quite, quite a bit, the increase message. We are of the household of faith. The house of faith must be founded on something solid as a rock. We're to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold on eternal life. We're told that in Timothy. And it's only through faith and through using our faith can we seize hold of that life in all its abundance that Jesus came to give us or died for us to enjoy. But there is an adversary of faith, and that is the devil. And he has a storm with your name on it. It said when the flood arose. It didn't say if the flood arose. It said when. And he's trying to knock you off what you're standing on. We ought to overcome the problems that the devil throws at us. Uh, because in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So Jesus taught, whoever comes to me, whoever hears my sayings, does them, will stand unshakable because his life is founded on the rock of his word. Or, or it's the revelation, founded on the revelation of his word. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked his disciples who the people said that he was. And he, he got various answers. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And if you remember, it's quite a familiar passage, I think, to most people. And, and Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's revelation knowledge that Peter had. It's not something that he could have worked out with his mind. And then Jesus went on to say, and I tell you that you are Peter. That means little stone. Peter. And on this rock, Rock of Revelation knowledge. I will build my church. We could have saved a few denominations there, couldn't we? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus said, I'm going to build my house, the church, on the rock. And all of hell can't destroy it. Then later in Peter, Peter must have got hold of this, you know, little stone, he must have got hold of it. And he mentions in one of his letters in 1 Peter 2.5, he said, you are as little, well it doesn't say little, but it is little, living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. So we need to build on the word, get the word into our lives as a solid foundation. And our faith needs to be fastened to something more solid than what we feel or what we think. In, in Hebrews 6, it, it talks about that we are heirs of the same promise as God gave to Abraham. Well, what promise did God give to Abraham? It's in Galatians. It tells us that God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. In you, all nations shall be blessed. 
And then in Hebrews, it says, and he confirmed it with an oath. Two things in which it's impossible for God to lie. So he's made a promise, he's given an oath. And they give a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. The soul is where we feel and we interpret the things we see, we hear in our soulish realm. So, the word in our heart we apply in order to steady us on God's promise. So that those things that, that we see and feel, you know, uh, we're reading God's word, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, but we don't feel healed. Our body doesn't feel that well. Well, the word is to steady us, to keep us going. We stand on the word and we don't look at the things that, that we see and hear and feel. So healing, peace, whatever it is, whatever God's promises that, that we're looking for in our lives. And we overcome the things that the devil's presenting to us or suggesting to our minds. You know, he will suggest this won't work for you. You know, he won't say, well, it, it doesn't work full stop. He'll say it won't work for you. It works for other people, but it won't work for you. <laughs> You're not strong enough. See, it's getting worse. You know, everybody is attacked by the devil in a similar way. We think we're kind of, you know, special and different, don't we? But yeah. the devil does attack people in, in pretty similar ways. Yeah. And we stand firm on the word until we receive the promise. And when we stay firm and shakeable on the rock, we are not going to collapse in the storm. Amen. But in order to do that, we need to be meditating on the word, getting it into our heart. So in Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, it says, My son, attend to my words. Give attention to my words. Yes. Pay attention. Incline your ear to my sayings. Yes. Yes. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them. We have to find them. We don't find them by sitting our Bible on the coffee table at home. That is not finding them. <laughs> We've got to open it up and find them. They are life to those who find them, and they are health or medicine to all their flesh. That is all their flesh. That covers any sickness or disease, doesn't it? All their flesh. As we find them and we attend to the word of God, getting in our ears and our eyes, it goes down into our heart. So your attention to the word through your eyes, through your ears, is the way to get the word into your heart. Yes. And then according to Hebrews 4.2, we mix the word with faith and it profits us. Yes. If we don't mix it with faith, it won't profit us. So we stand on the word to overcome the storm. The devil says, you're not going to get your healing this time. We say, no problem, devil, I'm already healed by the stripes of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.24 says, I, I, by his stripes I was healed. But the devil says, you're going to die. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of God. We answer every thought that the devil tries to uh, pull us down with, with the word of God. Don't try to negotiate with the devil, you won't win. Or give him a testimony of somebody else. You won't win that way either. Just use the word of God against him. That's how Jesus defeated the devil and it's how we defeat the devil with the word of God. And that's how we pull down, it was mentioned yesterday, pull down strongholds, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we stand on the word to overcome the storm. The storm is not from God. He doesn't send storms to teach us. He gave us his Holy Spirit for that and teach us in the church. What is your house built on? Is your house built on a firm foundation? Is it built on the word? That will determine whether you stand or fall when the storm comes. And, you know, we need to settle a few things in our own hearts before God. We need to settle that his word is truth for a start. And we have to become determined to act on the word. In order for your faith to be built onto something solid, you need to start with the word. And act like it's true. You know, back to like Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? 
I used to think that, that meant that if I slipped up and didn't do something, I'd lost my salvation. It doesn't mean that at all. So just in case you're thinking that, it doesn't mean that. I'm sure nobody would think that here. Make sure you base your faith on the word. Faith comes by hearing, not having heard. So don't base it on things like I say that you've heard somebody say or a memory of something. Even a memory of having read, the, oh yeah, I read that last week. Well, open up your Bible and read it today because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And you find the rock to stand on. You stand on the rock, you're on your way to victory. So, yeah, a few good few years ago now, we went overseas and uh, I ate something that I probably shouldn't have eaten while, I, while we were there. And I got sick as a result. I ca we came back to Sydney and then I got sick. And I was anointed with oil and had the prayer of faith prayed over me. It was pretty handy. I didn't even have to go to church to call for the elders. Did I? <laughs> I didn't have to move very far at all. <laughs> and that particular evening, I was, I was at home and I, I just wanted to sleep. My body was hurting and all I wanted to do was sleep. And this verse came into my head, Jesus saying, could you not watch with me one hour? <laughs> and I really did not feel like praying for an hour, I can tell you. But I sat and I prayed in tongues for an hour and I, I did that. And uh, when you're sick like that, it's largely down to what you do. You know, other people can support you, but it's down to what you do or what you've done already in the past. Um, it's down to your relationship with God. Yes. And, and you can overcome. Don't just give up at the first hurdle and say, oh, well, that's it. Um, you can overcome. We had that earlier scripture, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. We can do this. <laughs> Well, the fever and, you know, the other, those other symptoms cleared up. But I was left with my digestive system just wasn't right. And uh, it was in pain. It was an effort to eat and, and so on and so on. And I got the scriptures and I just kept saying the healing scriptures over and over and over me, uh, reading them out. Did I do it perfectly? No, I didn't. And after a while, I wasn't consciously thinking this is not working. And I certainly would not have said, well, this word of faith stuff just doesn't work and thrown it out the window. But I'd slacken off the word for a little bit because I was taking more notice of how I felt and the, the sense realm than, than I was taking of the word. And that, that is going from faith to fear. You don't want to go that way around. You, you go from fear to faith. Leave the fear behind. And, and I wasn't, just wasn't being as proactive as I should have been with the word. And then I'd repent and I'd get back on the word and just sharpen up on it a bit. And at those times that I was standing strong on the word, I felt safe. You know, I knew everything's okay. It's going to be okay. Uh, God's got me. And that is the rest that, that Apostle Gary was talking about yesterday. You're just trusting God, trusting his word. Everything's going to be okay. And it, it was a, a little while, but as storms do, it passed. And my digestive system has been really healthy for a good few years now, hasn't it? Many years. And we also, we have a better diet today as a result of that. So uh, <laughs> that's pretty good. Storms don't last forever, they do pass. But the shape we're in when they've passed will depend what we've done primarily before the storm. Uh, if we've laid a foundation of the word, we will stand during the storm. And if you say, well, I haven't got time for that, well, you probably have got time to be sick, to run around looking for a solution to your problem, or to sit worrying about your problem. Uh, the answer's found in the word, and trusting in the word. But it does take time. It, it takes time and effort to get into the word and get the word into us. We labor to enter that rest. We're, we had that yesterday, that's Hebrews 4.11. And if we will uh, labor and work at putting the word in, we can rest during a storm, knowing that all is well. Faith rests. That's one of the things that faith does. It rests. Yes. And the foundation, if you look at houses, the foundation is much more important than the trimmings. I sometimes think that that parable that Jesus told, that maybe both those houses looked identical, but they were very different in the result that they got. And the foundation's more important than the trimmings. All the carpets and the nice pictures in the world won't help 
a foundationless house during a storm. And our lives can be kind of trimmed up on the outside, can't they? We can have every CD on the shelf and every translation of the Bible, plus a few more that haven't even been translated yet, on the bookshelf, so that we look the part. But are we basing our faith on the Word? Because that's when we become unshakable. So that's uh, for faith to work, it needs to be in your heart. And I, I said Romans 10.8, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. So we'll go on to look at the word in our mouths. It's actually, it's mentioned first. And one of the ways to get the word into our hearts is for us to speak it out. Your own spirit is most sensitive to your voice. You know, you, you can receive the word into your heart from people preaching, but you, your spirit is actually more sensitive to your own voice. So it's like a circular thing. When we've got the word in abundance in our hearts, it will come out of our mouths. Because Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we can speak the word to get it into our hearts, and then it overflows and comes out of our mouths. And when we have faith... Uh, we can get the answer to every situation we can face for the rest of our lives. So that's pretty good, isn't it? So it's important then that we understand how, how to get faith and how to operate in faith. Faith in God, faith in the Word. And faith is the only way to live in victory here on this earth. We take the Word of God and we apply it to every situation in our lives. And God has a desire to meet our every need, whether it's spirit, soul, or body. And when we cooperate with him, believing him, speaking and acting on his word, we see our needs met. Because we're enabling him to do what he wants to do for us. In Galatians 3.23, Galatians 3.23, it says, Before faith came... We were held prisoners, so this isn't the New King James, by the way, I think this is the NIV, I'm not sure. Before faith came, we were held prisoners, locked up, until faith should be revealed. So, before faith, we're held prisoners to this realm, uh, to, to this world in the natural part of our lives. We might be born again, but we're not really benefiting from it. And, and that was like me, like I was. I was born again, but I wasn't really benefiting a lot from... I would have gone to heaven when I died, but I wasn't benefiting a lot on this earth from being born again because I was being held prisoner. But then I heard the word of faith and I did something about that. You know, I didn't know any difference but to be sick when sickness came and to be in lack. Well, I, actually, I had a very good job, so I was really in lack. But I didn't know any alternatives to the things the devil might have thrown at me. Uh, we had yesterday that verse uh, right at the end from Hebrews 2, um, that through death Jesus might deliver those who through fear of death were throughout their lives subject to bondage. There's the bondage again. Uh, fear, it's a bondage. But Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. You know, we've been given life and we're supposed to reign in life. Yes. Through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, which we receive by, guess what? We receive it by faith. Yes. And we reign in life. Romans 10, 6 to 8. Let's have a look at that whole passage a moment. We've had uh, Romans 10, 8, haven't we? Romans 10, 6 to 8. But the righteousness which is based on faith, there it is, righteousness is based on faith, says, so faith speaks. Yes. The righteousness which is based on faith says, it says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Mm. But what does it say? What does the righteousness which of faith say? It says this. It says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. 
So we'll just go back to where that scripture comes from. You don't need to turn to it if you don't want to, but it's in Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 11 to 14. Because I think you might get a little bit more out of looking at it where it is in the Old Testament. So it says this, it says, uh, This commandment, or this word which I am commanding you today, is not hidden from you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, so that we may hear it and do it? Does that sound familiar? The wise and the foolish builders? Yeah. Hear and do. Well, actually, the, the foolish one didn't do, did he? He came and he heard, but he didn't do. It's not beyond the sea, so that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us, so that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may do it. So, the reference, that's Deuteronomy, sorry, Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14. So he's saying, if you will listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what he says, you'll receive the blessing. Amen. It's not hard, it's not far off, the word is near you. You don't have to go up to heaven to get it, that's how most Christians pray. Like the answer to their problem is in heaven, and if they can just somehow get God to release the answer to that problem, they'll be all right. But the truth is that God has already made provision for your answer here. Amen. And that's the thinking that we need to turn around in our minds to, to walk by faith. You don't have to go to God and say, God, I need you to heal my body. I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. No, we need to rebuke sickness and disease because God has already healed us. He's already done everything he's going to do. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says that Jesus, well, he doesn't say Jesus because he hadn't been born then, but Jesus bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases and by his stripes you are healed. I've been confessing a scripture over me uh, the last few weeks. Uh, it's Matthew 15, 13. I mentioned it at the women's group the other day, for anybody that was there. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted in my body will be uprooted. Right. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted in my body will be uprooted. And I was confessing that, and in the back of my mind, my thinking was, I don't know, I was consciously thinking it, but uh, my thinking sort of went along these lines. I confess it, and my Heavenly Father does the uprooting. And, but it was this morning, it hit me, while I was preparing this, that it doesn't actually say that. It says, it doesn't say my Heavenly Father will uproot it. It says every plant which my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. So by saying and saying and saying, I'm getting my believing straightened out. Once my believing's straightened out, then I can receive what's already been done for me. So it's faith in the word. It's not uh, faith in what we think the word says. So if we want things to change in our lives, God's, God's given us his word. He's given us promises. We speak it out of our mouths by faith and, and we see our circumstances change. God's not going to change things for you. He gives you everything so that you can change things through him. Faith is that powerful. It's powerful, isn't it? When we start to use our faith, it is a really powerful thing. We don't expect anything to come to pass. You know, you hear people, they, they sort of hear like something on faith and then they're off just like, well, I'd like this and I'd like that. And uh, We don't expect anything to come to pass by faith in our lives that's not in his word. If it's in his word, we know it's his will. That's what he wants for us and we can have it if we'll, oper we'll exercise our faith for it. We're not commanding or demanding God to do anything for us. We're taking what he's already given to us. And, and we're putting it in our heart, the word in our heart and in our mouth to receive what he wants us to have. You know, every, every parent, they want things for their children and they want them to have them, don't they? They want them to access them. They don't want them to just be left there untouched. And, and God's like that. He doesn't want us to just leave all these promises untouched. 
When it comes out of our heart and out of our mouths, it changes our circumstances. Nowhere in the Bible is there that it says to pray to God for him to do something about the devil. He's already done it. According to the word, he's destroyed him in Hebrews 2. He's disarmed him. He's triumphed over him, Colossians 2. He, and he did all that for us. He didn't need to do it for himself. He'd already booted him out of heaven. He did it for us. Now he's given us the authority to stop an already defeated foe from trampling all over our lives. We are told to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And we resist him with our words. We speak. Faith speaks. And most Christians, even if they believe that the devil is their problem, they want God to talk to him for them. God wants you to talk to the devil. In the name of Jesus, Satan, I rebuke you. You get off my life, you get off my children, you get off my body. And the only place where we read, God will do it, is what we heard yesterday about tithing. If we're tithers. But we still have to say, we still have to say, I'm a tither. No, Satan, you can't have that. God rebukes you for my sake. We've still got to say something. So back to Deuteronomy 30. We don't need to ascend up into heaven. We don't need to talk God into meeting our needs. We've been redeemed from the curse so that everything we lost through the fall is restored. What God did in Jesus is greater than what the devil did in Adam. Amen. Otherwise, none of us would be here this afternoon. The word... The answer is not far off. You don't need to go over the sea for it. It tells you that. Where is it? It's near to you. It's in your mouth, in your heart, so that you may do it. So as well as faith talking, it has cor faith has corresponding action. Whatever we believe, we will act upon. So whatever you're believing in your heart, you're going to act on anyway. So if it's the word of God, you'll be acting on the word of God. You know, it wasn't easy for me to keep speaking the word when... I was sick and my digestive system wasn't right. We, it, it may not be easy. It sounds simple, and it is simple, but it may not all the time be easy. But, you know, and it, frankly, it is easier to sit and worry. You know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Yeah. Or this is for life. You know, this is it now. I've got this for life. Yeah. It's, that is easier, but it's counterproductive, and it's not going to produce any results. It's never going to overcome a problem by speaking what you don't want or what you already have. Jesus said in Mark 11:23, this is my version, it's very short as well. He said, you'll have what you say. He said it a bit longer than that, but you can read it. So, if you want more of what you've already got, just keep on talking about it and nothing will change. But, if we put what we want, which is God's promises, from the word in our heart, in our mouth, we will still have what we say, but it will be what we want to come to pass. It will be good. Well, many Christians, and, and I know I've done this, they're believing God on the one hand, and they say all the confessions in the morning, and, and then they're talking the problem the rest of the time, or some of the time. So they're doing, kind of doing both. Well, you can't actually be in faith and fear at the same time. Either you're, in one, you're flipping backwards and forwards from faith to fear, faith to fear. Worry which is fear-based, will try to get us projecting into the future. You know, this thing's never going to go, and then I'll be unable to work in a few years, so golly, I won't have an income, I'm going to lose my house, I'll be homeless. It's all stuff in the future. And you're like, you're 20 years down the line, and you're homeless and poverty-stricken. And But faith is always now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And nothing is too big for God. You know, it doesn't matter to God, or we could say it doesn't matter to faith what it is. If we will say it, and we can get our minds around and over it, we can have it. So, you may have had, like, uh, doctors talking negative things to you. Well, you've got to get your mind over and beyond that with the Word of God. The problem can be screaming at us. But there's nothing your faith can't overcome if you're willing to work on your faith and develop it. When you begin to see victory on the inside, 
which is what you get by meditating on the words. You can't stop it from appearing on the outside. You asked the lady with the blood issue that. She said, she kept on saying, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. If only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. She was getting that image on the inside of her, of her being well, touching the hem of the, Jesus' garment, being made well. And, and then uh, later on it says, immediately the flow, uh, well as she touched the hem of his garment, immediately the flow of blood ceased. Because she had it on the inside and it just came to pass on the outside. We need to get a hold of our mouths so that we're, we're not believing for one thing and then speaking another. That's like trying to walk in two different directions at once. You won't do it. We believe God. That's a, that's a decision. That's a choice. We believe God and we speak pure faith words. If you can get your mouth and your faith straightened out, you'll have it. There was a woman who was diagnosed with terminal cancer and she was actually given a short time to live. And she started, a man of God told her if she would start to confess the word of God over herself, she would live. So she started to and, and address the devil. She started to address the devil, she started to talk faith all day. Well, she had nothing else to do, she was, she was dying, so she had nothing else to do. So she confessed the word all day. And eight months she did that for, no change. Kept going, kept going, kept going, all day. After eight months, she started to see improvement in her body until she was totally free from that cancer and she was going all around giving testimonies of how God healed her. Well, she started at the point of her diagnosis. You can start now putting the word into your heart. And as you, you put that word into your heart, it will overflow out of your mouth. You put it in until it overflows out your mouth. That's how you know you've, you've got enough word in you when it begins to overflow out your mouth. Keep going until you have. And there was another woman, and her husband was critically ill and in a coma. Young couple. I think they were in their 30s. I'm not quite sure. And he was in a coma in the hospital. And uh, again, she was told to speak over her husband. A man of God told her, if you will speak over your husband, that he will live and not die, and he will declare the works of God, he will live. And so she did it, and she just kept saying it, kept saying it over him, over him. And she probably used other scriptures as well. But all the time. The medical profession gave him no hope, but he came out of that coma and he made a full recovery. Oh. You know, we don't need to ask God, do you want me well? Do you want me to prosper? He's already told us in his word what he wants for us, so the choice is ours. If we read on in Deuteronomy 30, it says in verse 19, Today I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So we get to choose. It's not a very hard choice, is it really? Life. Which would you prefer, life or death, blessing or cursing? But in case we're in any doubt, he goes on to say, Therefore, choose life. So, if we're unable to choose, there's a clue. And when we choose the faith way, we're choosing life. But anywhere else, we're choosing fear, which leads to death. And I just want to tell you about a lady I, I knew back in my home city. This was years ago. Um, she was a, a hopeless alcoholic, and she was lying on a bed just dying of alcoholism. And we were in her room, and we talked to her for a, a good length of time one, one night, and just didn't feel like we were sort of making much headway. I think her final words to us that night was, well, I'll just keep my bottle of gin by the bed because I'll probably need it in the morning. So that was how far we got with her. Anyway, I went to bed, got up the next day. I was going to work. I was just having a shower, and I felt a very strong impression to get a message through to her to give her that, that scripture, Deuteronomy 30, 19. This day I have set before you life and death. Now choose life. And I didn't... My friend that was with me lived next door to her. I couldn't contact her directly, so I contacted my friend. I had to really rush because I was going to work, like I say. And I said, can you, can you tell her this? You know, I believe God's spoken to me, and she needs to hear this. So she passed on the message, and later on she gave me the reply. She said, uh, she replied, yes, I choose life. Now, I didn't know what she meant by that, but I found out a few years later, uh, she put the drink down. She got some help, and as far as I know, she's still sober today. So we can choose life and we live.
So if we all put the word into our eyes and our ears, it gets down into our heart until it comes out of our mouth, and then we act on it, our circumstances will change. So faith has to do with your heart and your mouth. Your future is stored up in your heart. And depending on what is stored up in your heart will be whether you overcome or whether you are like the rest of the world and follow the rest of the world. Faith, it won't work as a mental exercise. Faith is in the heart and mouth. It's not in the mind. Saying is what applies the word in you to this natural world. So when you say, you're applying the word that's inside of you to this natural world. And if you really believe that, you'll get busy putting the word into you and putting it in, putting it in. Because it does, like I say, it takes time. If you want great faith, you need great hearing. You know, a lot of people want great faith. It's like, it's like wanting to be a concert pianist, isn't it? Never practice. <laughs> Remember the 12 spies in uh, Numbers 13 and 14? Joshua and Caleb, they came back, and again, this is my version, but they basically said, yes, there are giants in the land, but God is with us. That's right. And, uh, that's right. And uh, uh, to Moses, uh, when uh, God's trying to get Moses to go to Pharaoh, he says to him, you go and I will be with you. He, well, he said exactly the same to us, go, yeah. and then he ended up by saying, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God didn't say we wouldn't have trouble. And he also didn't say, I'll disappear in times of trouble. <laughs> but we act like that sometimes, don't we? <laughs> Psalm 91.15 says, I, I will be with you in trouble. Yes. Yes. When the storm comes, we easily forget that one fundamental truth. He's with us. Yes. He is on our side. If God be for us, who can be against oh, us? Lord. God's love, and there is no fear in love. When we walk conscious of God's presence, and we can only do that through faith, God's presence with us, then the fear goes. Thanks. Oh, that was